Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm Professor Sturt. I'm with the Institute of Criminology and Criminal Justice. I'm just going to share a few words, offer land acknowledgement, and then we'll go ahead and get started. So we acknowledge that the location of this campus is on the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation, so the Anishinaabek. And in doing so, we acknowledge our responsibility to not only the Algonquin people, but also the responsibility to adhering to Algonquin cultural protocols. So unceded means that this land that we're on was never um, entered into treaty. It was never given up, it was never surrendered. So technically it's not Canada's, although Canada likes to tell a narrative about itself that it's theirs, but it's not. And what that means is that there is a responsibility to kind of reframe the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. And we acknowledge that the Algonquin people do have an inherent right to this land and that we are guests here. Um, and part of that also acknowledges the longstanding relationships and ties that Algonquin people have had in this area that extends thousands and thousands of years, which also draws our attention to the fact that Canada is actually really infant. If you think about the fact that Canada's only really been around 150 years, but the way that human history has structured herself for probably, I don't know, tens of thousands of years, it really isn't um, very long, you know, but the Algonquin people have he been here far longer than that. And it's important that we pay our respect to the relationship to the land in the sense that for us, we have, as Indigenous people, we have responsibilities to all our kinship relations. It's not just people, but also to the land, to the waters, and this long-standing, underst this understanding will continue on as long as the land exists, the trees exist, and the water flows. So that's our commitment and our responsibilities as Indigenous people, and the Anishinaabek people take that relationship very seriously. So for us, the, the nation-state is just a, sometimes a mild inconvenience. Um, to our sovereignty. <laughs> so that's just a little bit reason why we do land acknowledgements, aside from just the symbolic kind of, oh, I'm going to read a couple of words, and it, it goes far beyond that. So thank you. So we're going to go ahead and get started, and we have some wonderful people, and I believe that Alex is going to do an introduction. Oh, Nick is going to do the introduction. Thank you. Good morning, Right. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Nicolas Carrier. I'm uh, the director of the Institute of Criminology and Criminal Justice. Uh, it is a pleasure to welcome you to this uh, winter colloquium. Uh, sadly, something we need to talk about are uh, people being killed in carceral settings. So uh, maybe one day we will be at a point in time where we don't. We can talk about this in history classes, but right now it is... Uh, in our present. So the Institute of Criminology and Criminal Justice delivers like undergraduate program where we focus on the limits and the problems associated with um, criminal justice institutions or criminal legal institutions. So uh, we're happy to support uh, the work of uh, notably the prison law support. I'm happy to announce that next year we're going to be offering to our students uh, a new very important class on prison law in action that will be led by uh, Alexandria and uh, Lydia. So I'm really happy to see them here. So that's it. That's it for me. Uh, important people now. Thank you, Dr. Carrier. Uh, my name is Alex McClelland. I'm a professor here at the Institute of Criminology and Criminal Justice. Um, that's in custody in Ontario jails and prisons and across Canada have been increasing at, in some places, an alarming rate. And um, there has been little institutional action or accountability or transparency on what is happening. So today we're bringing together uh, people who are involved in a movement calling for no more deaths, on custody, no more deaths in custody, who uh, come from the legal realm, People, family members, people with lived experience, um, academics, and people working on strategies to mobilize for change to get there to be some action to address the um, dramatic rise in death. So to begin our conversation, I'm going to hand over our hand over uh, uh, the mic to Yusuf Akiri, who is going to be beaming in to speak with us. Um, Yusuf. Um, 
is the founder of Justice for Sali, um, which he founded after his brother Solomon Fakiri was killed in custody in 2016 at Central in Central East Correctional Center. Yusuf Fakiri is a career civil servant with a background in policy and areas of mental health, conflict, interest, refugee, and francophone rights. His most rewarding and passionate work is advocating within the justice system for vulnerable communities who suffer from mental illness. In 2016, as I mentioned, he founded the Justice for Sali movement, a grassroots national, national organization after the tragic death of his brother. Um, he holds a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and History from Wilfrid Laurier University. Um, he has a diploma in French from the University of Laval. <clears throat> He's fluent in English, French, and Farsi. And he has a significant media presence in Toronto and Montreal in both English and French. He, as many of you have probably seen him in his appearances calling for accountability about his brother's death on CBC, Radio Canada, uh, CTV, Global News, City TV, uh, CP24, and in the Toronto Star uh, as an advocate. And so I'm going to now hand it over to Yusuf, who I believe is on Zoom, and we will hear him speak for uh, a, a number of minutes, then I'll hand it over to our next speakers. So handing it over to Yusuf. Good uh, good afternoon, uh, respected uh, brothers and sisters in humanity. I greet you with the greetings of peace and actions that were not given to Suleiman in his final moments as he tragically lost his life at the hands of correctional officers, taxpayer-funded guards by the Ontario government who beat Suleiman Faqiri to death. Our story... Our story began after Suleiman's tragic death in 2016 for the Fakiri family. The story of no more deaths in custody began many, many more years ago with many wonderful individuals in our room that have done the important work. As Dr. Carrier said in the beginning of the conversation, this should be in history classes. As uh, Dr. McLennan said, this, this work, no more deaths in custody, when there's a lack of transparency and accountability, we are going to have the many more Suleimans. We are going to have the many more Justin saint amour or the Ashley Smiths. Because when there's no accountability and transparency in the system, and when there are when when these institutions are behind, institutions are behind what the general public is asking, that you're going to have tragedies. So before I start my conversation about Suleiman's story, I just want to make sure, ladies and gentlemen, that this conversation this afternoon as there is many conversations after or before, is the work of many people that decided to build a better, a better society because of tragedies. Yet they didn't they were forced to. And the work, whether you know Alex and his team, or Lydia Dobson, or Megan Linton, or the folks at CPIP, this is the work that we're forced to do, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and it's not by choice. It is not by choice, but it's a life and death issue. And this is very important. I'm going to come back in our conversation with the concepts of accountability and transparency, foreign terms that exist within the justice system, foreign term that exists within folks that suffer from mental illness when they lose their lives at the justice system, ladies and gentlemen, that are given to their loved ones in body bags, given to their loved ones in body bags without being able to celebrate their birthdays or go out with their families. Those are things where they're able to celebrate those milestones instead a system that operates away from scrutiny, from accountability and transparency. And yet there's a double standard, ladies and gentlemen, one for all of us, within, one for all of us within, the, within Canada, and one for the rest of the law enforcement. And this is very important. And that's going to come in our theme of our conversation. But we are not studying this in history class, ladies and gentlemen. This is the present. This is going, whether we're in Ottawa, Toronto, Montreal, um, Halifax, Vancouver, Winnipeg, there are stories like this. And Suleiman's story is a part of many of these stories, ladies and gentlemen, and that's very important for us to keep in mind um, as we're talking about this. And all of us have an obligation and a duty. Today started with you, ladies and gentlemen, with coming and joining this conference, but we have a duty to hold our leaders accountable. And before I, I, I share Suleiman's story, it is quite tragic, ladies and gentlemen, that when we have leaders to this day saying that they're gonna build more prison systems, that they're gonna build more prison systems, couldn't that money maybe be spent better on Canadians suffering from mental health ch challenges to find better beds when there's a hospital shortage for individuals suffering from mental health challenges? But we're building more prisons. 
We're building more prisons in a system, in a system that is not held accountable, in a system that continues to operate and have its own internal oversight that in itself will create. There is no such thing as internal oversight, ladies and gentlemen, internally. And, and this is the background of what happened to Suleiman's story. I'm honored to speak in front of you. I would have preferred to have spent this Ramadan. Ramadan is the day where Muslims around the world, they fast with their loved ones. I would have, been, I would have preferred to spend this time with Suleiman, fast with him. But here I am, more than seven years after his tragic death, sharing his story. And I will continue to share his story because Sully's tragedy for me is my family, is my family's efforts to honor him to make sure another Suleiman does not go through, does not go through, or my family does not go through what, my, what Suleiman went through because this needs to stop. The title of this talk is No More Deaths in Custody. And the wonderful speakers will talk about this. There shouldn't be any more deaths in custody. But as we're speaking today, there's more tragedies happening across our nation. So let's talk about Suleiman's story, ladies and gentlemen. And, and before I, I, I talk about the tragic end of his life, I want to just add a couple of things about the couple of minute, the minute, the few minutes that I have here, a couple, a couple of minutes about who Suleiman was. There's so many amazing things that I could talk about my late brother, but I want to humanize my late brother. He wasn't just someone who died, or what we call, we use these difficult terms, the inmate, you know, this very dehumanizing term. Sully was a son, was a brother. He was studying engineering at the University of Waterloo. He taught my mom how to read. He taught my brother how to drive. He spoke Arabic, Farsi, and English. He was a gifted mind. He was a gifted athlete in high school. But more than anything, Suleiman was a loving member of the Fikiri family. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia after, after a car accident in his second semester uh, when he was studying at the University of Waterloo. But Sully was more than that. And my family did everything we could, ladies and gentlemen to give Sully the support. But we were privileged as a family, ladies and gentlemen, to be able to give Sully the support, to have a place for him to sleep. What about all the other individuals that don't have the means or the ability? What about them? We need to think about them today, ladies and gentlemen. Because the system, the system does not support these families. And this is very important. So I want to talk about and let you know who Sully was. Because Sully was so much more than just his illness. And I made a promise to him the day that he lost his life, where I found out in that horrible December, 6, December 15, 2016 night, that I would make sure that Sully's death would not be the end, not be the last part of his chapter, because my brother was much more than that. But more than anything, Suleiman was an incredible soul, was an incredible man that made my family into better people. He made us understand made us understand how much more work that we need to do as a family, as a community, in the treatment of Canadians suffering from mental health challenges. And Sully, we learned that from Sully, and his legacy continues to live on. Out of respect for time, I, I, I'm going to move on to what happened in the case. And, you know, if maybe in Q&A, if you have any questions about who Sully was personally, I will, um, I will, share, I will, sh I will share that with you. But... Um, and I apologize, ladies and gentlemen, usually in my talks, this part is usually the hardest part because I love my brother. We're only 18 months apart. Uh, we came to Canada as refugees from Afghanistan originally. We were very close and I miss him every day. And the seven years has not taken, we're going on to eight years in about six months, has not taken away the pain um, that my family continues to feel. So the next couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about the three police investigations. I'm going to talk about the coroner's report. I'm going to talk about the inquest. And I'm going to talk about the ministry's internal investigation. And then I'm going to talk about where we are today, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I'm sure folks have been warned. This is a very, he, there was a very violent end to his life, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, um, just as a trigger warning, at the time of his death, uh, Suleiman, uh, both his legs and his hands were tied. He was pepper sprayed twice. He had 50 bruises on his body and both his legs and his hands were tied as more than a dozen guards took turns beating him to death. And he was on his stomach down with a spit hood. And according to the eyewitness, Mr. John Thibault, uh, one of the guards had his knee on Suleiman's neck. And for folks uh, who have the stomach for it, um, there is two publicly available videos um, um, that shows the final, uh, one that shows Suleiman, the final moments of Suleiman's, um, uh, Suleiman's end. It is, uh, it is available publicly. You could see it online, ladies and gentlemen. Another video is, um, is a guard who, who, 
probably one of the few decent people that treated him decently in that in those 11 days when he was in in that jail in that horrible institution um that that showed how sick so man was how unwell he was um and uh, you see the difference with somebody showing compassion versus someone uh versus uh, the brute force that the guards used uh, when they killed Saul and when they beat him to death Solly was taken into custody on December 4th, temporary into custody on December 4th, 2016. He lost his life on December 15th in 2016. So 11 days, ladies and gentlemen. In 11 days, a lot of things happened. In those 11 days, my family drove to Lindsay four times. We tried to see him. Not once were we able to see him, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and we did not know what happened to him uh, and why they didn't let us see him, ladies and gentlemen, until information came out of the inquest, which was more than seven years, more than seven years, um, almost seven years, since this tragic murder. Um, we, um, uh, three days before his death, uh, my father and I made arrangements uh, through a judge to transfer Solomon to a hospital. But he never made it, ladies and gentlemen. That was 72 hours before his death. Um, and one of the reasons he wasn't able to be transferred because he was waiting for a bed. Um, so you have a very active family, ladies and gentlemen. And on top of this, my dad, uh, on those course of those 11 days, um, try to reach out um, uh, to the jail to get Solomon the help, the medication. But it seemed like, it, it, it. and you'll notice when I speak about the inquest, none of our information or anything that we said was ever relayed to the system. And this is what happens, ladies and gentlemen. This is why we're having conversation. This is what happens when a system does not operate, uh, uh, operates away from scrutiny, away from transparency and accountability. This is the common theme. This will continue to happen, right? You have an active family that tried our best, and the system, it never went, in, it never, it never, it, it never was ever, ever articulate, like that articulation was never appreciated by staff at that jail. So that's, that's the 11 days. And, 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 and the ironic tragedy, ladies and gentlemen, is that it took my family 11 years to take care of Suleiman. Yet it took the jail system 11 days for him to be killed. Let that sink in. 11 years of taking care of Suleiman, yet 11 days from the time he went to the time that he lost his life. Let's talk about the investigations, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, the first police investigation uh, took place, um, was, uh, was taken over by the Quarter Lakes Police Service uh, right after Solomon's tragic death. And the Quarter Lakes Police Service is the Lindsay Jail, is effectively the Lindsay Jail. So it's the local jail investigating the local, um, it's the local police investigating the local jail. The local jail, local police investigating the local jail. They took a year in their investigation. After all this information that even came out of the coroner's report, the first coroner's report, and they did not press charges. They did not give a reason why they did not press charges. And then it came out that they never spoke, that they never spoke with the eyewitness, John Thibault. Um, John, it came out that John Thibault, uh, they never spoke with the eyewitness. They closed the case a couple of days before. John Thibault was found in um, the fifth estate, ended up speaking with Mr. John Thibault. Then the, to the credit of the office of the chief coroner, they took the case back. They sent the case, uh, the uh, coroner's office reopened the case. They sent the case to the OPP. That was the first OPP investigation. So now we're going to the second investigation. They took the case to the OPP. The OPP took 20 months in their investigation, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and I know I know I'm giving a lot of information, so I appreciate um, I appreciate that this is a lot. They took they took now now we're in, in January 2019 until mid summer 2020. OPP took uh, 20 months in their investigation approximately, and because the first coroner's report, the first coroner's report, even though it was um, it was a very comprehensive coroner report, it's 50 bru it highlighted Solomon had 50 bruises, legs and his hands were tied. He was pepper sprayed. And all that information, but the corner, the first corner's report gave Solomon's cause of death of unascertained. So the OPP hid behind that corner's report, and in mid-summer 2020, they decided they made the decision to not press charges against the guards, and they made this preposterous statement saying that we cannot press charges on the guards or the rationale because we don't know which guard gave the fatal blow. There's too many, too essentially, too many people beat him to death. Um, that's the that's the OPP. Uh, but as you'll notice, agent, there's a constant theme, ladies and gentlemen, of resilience uh, with the Justice for Soli movement, essentially led by my mother to her, to her, 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 her constant you know, uh, faith and persistence that we need to keep fighting because we don't, my mom does not want someone else to go through what, what happened to her beloved son. And, and that's where that inspiration comes from. So we kept going. 
And then in the summer of 2021, ladies and gentlemen, um, um, so now the OPP closes their investigation. They told us that they can't press charges because we don't know which guard gave the fatal blow. Summer of 2021, um, the chief pathologist, Dr. Michael Polanin, uh, decided to review the, ch um, uh, the case with the, with the recent information of Mr. John Thiebaud's information coming out. And by the way, the first investigation that the OPP, ladies and gentlemen, did, they spoke with Mr. John Thiebaud this time, unlike the first investigation, and they told Mr. Thiebaud, they called Mr. Thiebaud, and they, they articulated that Mr. Thiebaud was uh, credible, yet they did not press charges. Now, now we're back in 2021, the summer of 2021. The chief pathologist decides, uh, Dr. Michael Flan decides to reopen, uh, decides to review the first pathology report. And he does a very comprehensive, um, uh, comprehensive um, report. And within a couple of months, uh, Dr. Polanyi comes up with a second with 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 um, a new conclusion. Um, and basically, Dr. Polanyi essentially articulated that the guards' actions, the guards' actions directly led to the death of Solomon Fikiri. The guards' actions led directly to the uh, to the death of Solomon Fikiri. The case now goes back to the OPP. Uh, the chief, uh, the office of the chief coroner sends the case back to the OPP. OPP takes six to seven months on their investigation. And mind you, ladies and gentlemen, we don't know what they did. We don't know what they did, who they spoke with, what they did uh, in the third investigation. Nor do we know what they did in the second investigation, frankly. So they take another six months. And then in early 2022, ladies and gentlemen, early, uh, mid, uh, early to spring 2022, OPP, uh, closes the case uh, and says that there is not sufficient evidence to press charges. 50 bruises, legs and hands tied, pepper sprayed twice, eyewitness, chief pathologist linking the guard's actions uh, to Solomon's death. Yet there's, no, there's not enough evidence to press charges. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, you heard that correctly. And, uh, and on top of this, most of the guards that murdered Solomon Fakiri are still employees of the Ontario government. Let that sink in as well. Most of the guards who murdered Solomon Fikiri are still employees of the Ontario government. Taxpayer-funded guards that are being paid by folks like yourself and myself uh, that are still employees of the Ontario government. So we're now into 20, uh, uh, 2022. I want to now go back, ladies and gentlemen, um, to um, uh, something called the CS. CSOI report. This is the, the Ministry um, of the uh, Ministry of the, of the Solicitor General. They did their own report. And in that report, and a lot of the information in that report came out of the inquest. But one of the things that's very important um, before I talk about the inquest is that the ministry did their own investigation. Now imagine the ministry investigating their own staff. Normally, there should be a third party or a, or a separate agency of government. But there, there is no, to this day, there is no oversight, ladies and gentlemen, in corrections, in provincial corrections, there's no oversight, right? Um, I've had the honor of working with, you know, uh, CPEP, Lindsay Jennings, with Dr. McClellan. We wrote a, we even wrote a paper, we even wrote a letter last year uh, where we had more than 30,000 signatures. Um, yet the minister did not respond to our letter. Yet 30,000 Ontarians signed our letter. Talking about oversight, because that theme is going to come, uh, come up, ladies and gentlemen. Anyways, um, the ministry did their own internal investigation. In that investigation, they fired two of the guards. But the other 10 or so, uh, they, there was, they're, 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 they're still employees of the Ontario government. And, and, and so that's the CSY report. I'm now going to get to the inquest, and then I'm going to finish off um, the present, the, the, at least the speaking part of the presentation, and then I'll leave you with a few words of reflection. Let's talk about the inquest here. Uh, the inquest, the inquest started in November 20, um, 2023, uh, late November 2023 until December, um, um, mid December, um, uh, mid December uh, uh, 2023. And it was a very painful inquest. It was a very difficult inquest, but it was an important inquest. And the inquest just shed light and showed um, the decayed system that the correctional system is in our province, 
and in many ways in our nation, ladies and, in Canada, in our nation, ladies and gentlemen. And that's very important for our conversation. It, it highlighted. This happened to Suleiman. This happened to Suleiman because the Justice for Sully movement and allies that are sitting in front of, that are sitting in those chairs that supported my family and Canadians that, that stood, that, that got the traction. But this story, this story is a story like many other stories. I want to make sure I'm not taken away from what happened to my late brother. But this story uh, happens to many people. And this is why we need to reflect on that. So let me talk about the inquest, ladies and gentlemen. And it's a lot to take in here. So it came out in the inquest that there were 60 policy breaches on the day of Solomon's murder. 60 policy breaches, ladies and gentlemen. Get no accountability. Imagine if myself or yourself, we, we, we commit a policy breach in our job, if there's a contravention, chances are we'd be held accountable. Yet none of the guards who, who mo uh, most of the guards with those breaches are still employees of the Ontario government, ladies and gentlemen. It came out that some of the guards lied in their reports, ladies and gentlemen. Some of the guards lied in their report on the day of what they did to Solomon Fakir, and it came out in the inquest because they played the video. Um, imagine that, lying and still uh, not being held accountable, ladies and gentlemen. It came out that some of the, uh, there was fraudulent, fraudulent uh, reporting on segregation in the inquest. But these weren't policy breaches, ladies and gentlemen, alone. This was my brother lo that lost his life. This was a human being that lost his life. This was my precious brother who lost his life, not just because of incompetency or of indifference, not just because of negligence, but of a beating, of a killing. This is someone who lost their lives, who lost his life. The doctor who took care of Suleiman, who I would say, quote, took care of Suleiman, who the GP, the general physician. And this is very painful for me to say, ladies and gentlemen, he was, he was in his feces. And here, here's the tragic part. Me and my family were, 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 we were, we were trying to get, we were trying to see him. As you notice, four times we tried to see him. And we didn't even know what was happening to him. Now imagine, this is a family that, that, that's active, that's going to go, that, that's active on trying to help their loved one. Other families don't even have that ability for, for many other difficult, tragic reasons. So we try to see him. But here's my brother who's in his own feces. And the doctor didn't send him to the hospital. And the doctor doubled down saying that I would not change anything if I could. I would do the same. Imagine that, ladies and gentlemen. Imagine that. Imagine still having that that preposterous arrogance to still not know what you did was wrong. It gets worse. It gets worse, ladies and gentlemen. The same doctor put in his notes that Solomon was asking for his mother. He was he put in those Solomon's asking for his mother. Whenever Solomon was in pain, he would call for my mom. I have to hear that. Believe me, I did not want to hear those things in the inquest. I didn't, but I had to do it because, because I don't want another family to go through what we went through. My mom, thankfully, still doesn't know that part. But the whole nation heard it. Sully was asking for his mother. But they made the claim, several staff in the jail made the claim that we did not know that we had the ability, ladies and gentlemen, to send, they call this inmate, I'm going to say human beings, to the hospital. Because here comes another issue, ladies and gentlemen. There was a tense issue between the hospital and the jail. But my brother paid, the, paid his life, paid, paid with his life. Why do we have different sectors in the justice system or healthcare operating in silos? What? These are human beings, but my brother had to pay the price. So they didn't send Sully to the hospital. They made the claim that because there was tense relationships. It came out that there's a difference. Uh, there, there was a tense relationship between nurse staff in the jail and, and, the, and the jails and the guards and the guards, like the healthcare staff and the, uh, uh, the healthcare staff and the guards, because it came out in the inquest, ladies and gentlemen, that the, and it, you can hear it. Um, uh, one of the nurse said that they had a plan ready for Suleiman. They had a plan ready for Suleiman to move him from one, uh, one segregation cell to another. But uh, you see in that video, ladies and gentlemen, one of the guards brute force, and then those were Sully's final moments. Um, and there's so much more, and, 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 and you could just see like this tension. It came out that there was an email sent, sent to 60 jail staff by one of the guards 
that Solomon was not well. He should not be here. 60. And in that, in that email thread, four to five deputy superintendents were, uh, and deputy superintendents for folks that um, are not aware of the, these are, these are the most senior managers, senior leaders in an institution. They were all copied that Sully is not well. But no one acted on it. And many claimed as they were, they were, you know, as they were speaking in inquest, they did not know that they, they, you know, they didn't look at that email, that they did not know they could do anything. 60 jail staff were informed. On top of this, you have his family that's very active, whether it's my dad, my mom, or me. Very active, ladies and gentlemen. 60 jail staff. It came out, and this is where, where our conversation uh, for today's discussion, where we need to have more uh I uh, need to have more of a conversation. What we need to do about is is this idea that the deputy superintendent, ladies and gentlemen, of segregation, get this, had no mental health training. The deputy superintendent had no mental health training. I hope I'm um, I'm okay for time, um, Alex. Let me know if I'm okay for time. Um, I'll um, I I know I. Uh... Okay, uh, that means okay. I didn't hear you, Alex. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. I'll continue. Just a few more minutes. Okay, perfect. That. No problem. The deputy deputy superintendent of segregation had no mental health training. Um, no mental health training, ladies and gentlemen. One of the expert witnesses, Dr. Heimovitz, uh, psychiatrist, argued that Solomon should have never been in a hospital. And here's the most tragic part out of all this, ladies and gentlemen. For almost for almost 1,200 human beings, there was one psychiatrist in that entire institution, and he was on vacation in the week when Solomon was brought to custody. So Solomon never saw a psychiatrist. And it came out in the inquest, ladies and gentlemen. It came out in the inquest that um, that jail still hasn't changed much. And in the, and the folks that have been following that jail, there's still been many deaths since then, ladies and gentlemen. So he didn't see a psychiatrist. He wasn't able to see his family, but he gets beaten to death. And now let's talk about, and there's no criminal accountability. There's no criminal accountability to Solomon's murder. What is, what is the verdict of the jail? What is the verdict of the inquest? The verdict came with, Almost 57 with 57 recommendations that Solomon's death was a homicide. There's no more doubt, ladies and gentlemen, Solomon Fikiri's death was a homicide. He didn't just roll over and die. There's many incredible recommendations that I had the honor of working with uh, uh, with folks uh, that are um, sitting uh, in front of uh, me and uh, you know with uh, other, the other parties in the inquest and my family supported those recommendations, but I want to talk about um, um, two, uh, they're all important, but two pertinent recommendations. One, ladies and gentlemen, um, the route to fixing corrections or, or the route, the route of at least trying to prevent tragedies, at least the beginning, is an accountability mechanism. Myself and the other parties, we argued to have an inspectorate, an inspectorate, ladies and gentlemen, where there's an external oversight. That was one of the recommendations. For an external oversight that 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 is not connected to corrections, but that's connected to Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, and that's 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 come up in the uh, the Baker recommendation. I think that that came out in a couple other recommendations. So, uh, so it came out in Solly's recommendation. We need to have an external oversight, and I wrote this in the Toronto Star as well. That's one of the recommendations. Solomon's death was a homicide. We now know that, ladies and gentlemen. We knew that for many years as we traveled across the nation with all the facts. The other recommendation, ladies and gentlemen, is that the coroner's office and the parties, we gave it like it was, it was, an, it was an opportunity to, to, to let this government to stand on the right side of history, at least at the beginning, ladies and gentlemen, where we said a simple statement that, and I'm, and, and I'm sorry, I'm paraphrasing, the simple statement was that jail is not an appropriate environment for Canadians suffering from mental health challenges and to put out like a public position statement within 60 days. Guess what, ladies and gentlemen? They've missed the deadline. It's as if people with mental health challenges are in those cages. Their, their, their lives are viewed cheap. People with mental health challenges, it's as if their lives are viewed cheap. 
It's as if they, they're not even being heard. And then you have leaders saying that, well, I will always stand with correctional officers. I'm going to continue to build jails. That's the, that's the two recommendations, ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to talk about. There's many more in, in our conversation. Where, we go, where do we go from here? I have faith, not in the system, but in folks like you and in folks in my fellow Canadians to build a better system and a better society for Canadians suffering from mental health challenges, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's uh, more than three months of Solomon's inquest, uh, inquest verdict. OPP hasn't done anything. They, were, they haven't even put out, they've sent several boiler point statements, ladies and gentlemen. Um, um, after all this recommend, after all of this information that came out, and I get inquests are non-biting, um, but there has still been no criminal accountability to Solomon's death. Um, I'm not going to let my brother's story go away. I will continue to fight for him because fighting for Sonny Man is giving other Canadians a vo uh, voices. And, and, and that's where the story for me continues, and that's where I work. I'm gonna I'm gonna end the presentation with 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 a final quote that is going for us to reflect as we get the Q and A as other folks um, uh, uh, start to you know uh, other speakers speak. This is the words from the Corners Council. Corners Council Julian Royce summarized it best. We killed Suleiman Fakiri. As a society, we know what is happening in our collective indifference. When we look in the mirror, it is painful to see who we really are. But this is a moment of reckoning, a moment a moment filled with possibility with redemption. That moment belongs to you, ladies and gentlemen, and it's an opportunity for you for us to build that better tomorrow. Thank you very much. Uh, Yusuf, much love, respect, and solidarity to you and our ongoing condolences for what happened to your family. <clears throat> it's very hard to hear about that experience. Um, it's a very devastating case, but it's not unique. And it's unfortunately um, common across this country. Um, and we'll learn more about that throughout the rest of our conversation. And Yusuf will be here with us um, throughout the conversation, and we'll be able to ask him questions uh, during the conversation or during the question period. Um, I'm going to hand it over next to two lawyers who intervened on behalf of the Tracking and Justice Project in the uh, in the inquest into Solomon Fakiri's death, um, Lydia Dobson and Alexandria Boney. Um, Lydia Dobson is an associate lawyer at Champ and Associates, an adjunct professor at the University of Ottawa in the Faculty of Law, and contract instructor at the Department of Sociology at Carleton Uni University, and soon with the ICCJ as well. Um, she has been actively engaged with prisoners' rights advocacy over for over a decade and is a founding member of the Criminalization, Punishment, and Education Project, as well as the Toronto Prisoners' Rights Project. Professor Dobson has worked extensively with prisoners experiencing solitary confinement, and her research and advocacy focuses on conditions of confinement in Ontario prisons and using the law as a tool for social change. Alexandria is an associate lawyer at ASAP Law, practicing mental health and prison law, and an adjunct professor at the University of Ottawa's Faculty of Law, where she co-teaches the prison law practicum. In the winter, Alexandria will be co-teaching Prison Law in Action at Carleton University. Alexandria has been involved in prisoners' rights advocacy for over a decade, first in Winnipeg and now in Ottawa. She has spoken on numerous panels with a focus on uh, uh, liberty, rights, and conditions of confinement experienced by prisoners. And she was also part of the legal team representing tracking and justice at the Fakiri Inquest. So I'll hand it over to both of you to talk about your work. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here today. Um, and thank you for the introduction, Alex. Uh, so I think something that you'll hear again and again throughout all of our presentations is that Solomon's experience is brutal and tragic, um, but it's not isolated. Uh, this, is, uh, this is something that we see when we practice law in this area happening again and again. Uh, just last week, I received a call from a mother whose son died and she only found out that the inquest was even happening the day before it started. 
Uh, and so this is going on right now. This is just last week. This is this is a constant uh, struggle that we're facing. And so what I'm going to talk to you uh, about today is just a little bit about the rising number of deaths in custody and then about the actual inquest process uh, that we went through. So um, it's important to know that deaths in custody, um, like Nick said, like Alex will, Alex will tell you more about, they're on the rise. You would think that as we are, you know, growing more awareness and more understanding of mental health issues, and as these inquests are being brought to light, um, as we're hearing all these news and media stories, that the number of deaths in custody would be lowering, but it's on the rise. So between 2010 and 2021, the rate of uh, deaths in Ontario-based institutions, so here in Ontario, increased by 173%. And it's important to understand uh, sort of the difference between Ontario jails and federal prisons. Um, I'm sure I can see a lot of criminologists in the room that you probably do, but for those who might not, um, an Ontario-based jail or a remand facility is, uh, is where people are serving less than two years, and the majority of those people haven't been sentenced. And that number of people who haven't been sentenced, who are technically legally innocent, is growing. So... About five years ago, it was around 60%. We're getting closer to 80% now. So 80% of people who are in the facilities that Solomon was in are legally innocent. They're awaiting a trial. Many others could be waiting for a bed in a mental health facility that doesn't have them. And at the same time that all of this is going on and that we're seeing these deaths rise, the Conservative government has fought to reduce access to bail, which means disruption. Um, so the Conservative government is fighting to reduce access to bail, which means that less people will be released, more people will be in these facilities, and they'll become overcrowded, or like what's happening in Kempville, the government will try to justify building more jails, more prisons, more incarceration. And this means, just looking at the statistics, more people will die. So this is the reality that we're faced with. Innocent people are dying in these institutions at higher and higher rates. But I also want to be clear, nobody should be dying in these institutions. Nobody should be in these abhorrent conditions, regardless of what they've done. And so what we're seeing happen more and more often is super inquests. And so these are inquests where we're looking at the death of not one, but multiple prisoners who have died in the same context or the same institution, and they're being clumped together because it's happening at such a high rate. But before we talk more about that, I want to talk a little bit about just what an inquest is and how it works. So an inquest is only meant to answer five questions. So who died, when they died, where they died, how they died, and by what means. And by what means someone died is also very narrow. The jury can only come up with five different answers to that question. So it can be natural causes, an accident, a homicide, which was determined in Solomon's death, a suicide, or just undetermined, which leaves a lot of room. So an inquest does not assign blame. So even though a jury can conclude that someone has been murdered, they're not permitted to name the murderer. So instead, the police of jurisdiction, like Yusuf told us, they can choose whether or not they're going to lay charges. And so in this case, the OPP did not. In terms of who can participate in a coroner's inquest, there are several players who automatically have a seat at the table. Um, so the first is obviously the coroner. And so in this process, the coroner acts like a judge. Uh, then you have the jury members. So these are five people plucked out of the public um, who are tasked with answering those questions that I just mentioned, those five. And then you have lead counsel, which is the lawyer who advises the jury, the judge, and the other parties about the legal side of what's going on. But something that I really want to hone in on, um, and it was 
made very clear to me, um, again, in a strikingly tragic way, um, when I received a call last week from a mother who didn't even know that the inquest was about to start for her own son, um, is that family members, loved ones, and advocacy groups who may want to participate, they need to apply to be part of the process to get that seat at the table. So it's not just automatically given. And during the Fakiri inquest, Alexandria and I, uh, we were retained to, to represent tracking injustice. Alex will tell you more about what tracking injustice is and does, but essentially uh, what we wanted to bring to this inquest was the voice of prisoners, right? Because the one prisoner that we're focusing on, sadly, didn't have the chance to be heard, didn't have a voice. Um, we can talk more about it, but um, Mr. Thibodeau, who was the only eyewitness, um, didn't participate in the inquest. Uh, and so we had no, uh, no people with lived experience giving their voices um, to what was actually happening inside this institution. Um, sadly, Lindsay uh, couldn't make it here today, um, but she was the witness who we called and she spoke to her own lived experience as a prisoner uh, in this inquest process. And so our, our goal here with the work that we do was to give voices to people with that experience. But what I really wanna highlight to you is um, how difficult that was and uh, how, how rare of an opportunity it was because there's a lot of costs associated with um, hiring a lawyer and going through a process like this, right? Um, so Alexandria and I, we run a not-for-profit prisoner legal supports and so we were able to do this uh, free of charge. But had we actually charged fees, minimum, absolute minimum fees for this, it would have cost about $50,000 to do this hearing. A three week long hearing is not cheap, right? And so if you're a family member trying to gain access and you don't have the funds or the means to do that, this isn't an easy process. You may be able to retain someone as legal counsel who would act for you on a pro bono basis, great. You may be able to try to participate without legal counsel, that's difficult, right? So the inquest process allows for family members or people who, um, who would like to apply for standing to apply to that uh, process and receive some funds for it from the government. But there's a stipulation on those funds that are made accessible and it's that the family member has to be a victim of a crime. So even though Soliman was murdered and the inquest tells you that, technically, to be a victim of a crime, the police have to have laid charges. And so there's no funding available to support families who are trying to intercept in these inquest processes. So the final point that I wanna leave you with is um, with the recommendation process, which Yusuf already touched on. But recommendations in a coroner's inquest are not binding. And that's why we're seeing the same recommendations being made again and again. Um, and if they're not followed, there's no legal recourse. We can say this was part of the inquest, this was the recommendation and you didn't follow it. And there's, as legal counsel, nothing we can do about that. We don't have a legal channel to force those recommendations to be implemented. So for advocates and lawyers who are trying to support this work and bring about social change and end deaths in custody in these abhorrent conditions, um, we're, we're questioning the process and whether or not inquests are uh, an effective means to that end. Um, and before I, um, I finish up today, um, I just, uh, just want to take a moment to appreciate Sarah Spate, who was a member of um, Tracking Injustice and did so much very important research and inspired us to do a lot of the work that we're doing today. Um, I also um, want to highlight the fact that we, um, we are a not-for-profit and so we do provide these services um, at no charge, but it, it costs money to file um, things in court. It costs money to print all of the thousands of pages of documents that we receive. And so um, we have a fundraiser next week. Um, I'm just gonna pass this around. If anybody's interested in participating, there's a QR code, you can join. It's a trivia fundraiser. And now I will pass it off to Alex to talk about the use of spit hoods. Thanks.
Hi all, thank you so much for being here today. And before I get into talking about the recommendations around spit hoods, I wanted to mention something or speak further on something Lydia mentioned and the significant role Lindsay played in being part of the inquest. So she is a person with lived experience and normally in an inquest, they do not have anyone come speak who has had lived experience. So the process of an inquest is supposed to be to give voice to the person that died and yet there is no one actually representing that experience there. So it was incredibly impactful and significant that Lindsay spoke that day um, because no one can truly understand what it's like to be imprisoned unless you've had to go through that. Um, so today, as Lydia mentioned, I'm going to speak to you specifically about recommendations and I'm actually going to focus on one in particular. Uh, that Tracking and Justice retained us to put forward, which was a total ban on the use of spit hoods. Um, and so it's entirely up to the jury to craft these recommendations, but we're able to put them forward and you know convince them why we would want this, and then they can adopt a final slate, which you hear, heard uh, Yusuf speak about, there is 57. And so Tracking and Justice specifically asked for a total ban on the use of spit hoods in correctional facilities. <laughs> And now, I'm just curious, can everyone put up their hands? Has anyone heard of a spit hood before? Okay, like a quarter, I would say. So to give you a visual, a spit hood is a piece of black mesh that goes over the head, front and back, and then it has another piece of cloth attached to the bottom to kind of come over the shoulders. It's something the guards use when an, a prisoner, and you're gonna hear me refer to um, people in prisons as prisoners, never inmates. Um, the guards use it when a prisoner is spitting. So in order to put that on them, they need to get into their physical space and physically put it over their head. And by definition of this situation, it's always a violent interaction. The spit hood is going over their head because they don't want to do whatever this guard is telling them to do. They're actively fighting it. So this is incredibly a violent experience every single time. Um, and there's also almost no evidence that these things actually work. So we all went through COVID. We have learned a lot about the transmission of diseases. And mesh does nothing to stop the transmission of diseases. Masks do, medical filters do. And if it's unfortunate, I wish I could have brought a photo, but the, the mesh has big holes in it. So it's not stopping anything. Um, but yet guards insist that this is necessary to prevent the spread of diseases. But again, uh, HIV is not spread through spit. Um, you're generally not bleeding from the face. Generally it would be the body or which the spit hood is not gonna cover. So there's little justification for it. And spit hoods in Canada actually come with a specific warning that says any improper use can lead to injury or death. And in the Fakiri inquest, Solgen, which is the Solicitor General's office, uh, the ministry that's in charge of corrections in Ontario, was forced, and I say forced because they never reveal their internal policies. Uh, I'm currently, as an aside, in a fight with them to try and get uh, access to these policies, which is how they deal with prisoners on a granular level, so how they use spit hoods. Um, so they were forced to reveal their spit hood policy. And there's five elements that I want you to keep in mind about this policy. One, a, in, a prisoner cannot be held face down with the hood on. Two they can't be left in restraints. Three, they can't be sprayed in the face with pepper foam or, or pepper spray, either of them. They cannot be left unattended in the spit hood. And they need to remove the spit hood as soon as reasonably possible. So the second they stop spitting, it's supposed to be removed. And now these are just the Ontario rules, but I think that these are generally best practices for putting a bag over somebody's head. I think that we can reasonably say that you shouldn't do any of those things. But as you heard a little bit from Yusuf, every single element of that policy was violated that night with Mr. Fikiri. He had a spit hood placed on him violently. He was pepper foam sprayed in the face twice. He was not decontaminated. So the, the spray was sitting in the hood and then they added more to it, which was still sitting in it, in the hood. Then then placed him face down with the hood they restrained his arms behind his back and they left him alone in the room. So every single element of that policy was violated that night. And as you heard from Lydia, this is not a rarity. In just this inquest, it was, I think, 60 uh, policy violations. So 
there, and we can assume that if it's happened here and it's revealed it's happening across Canada in every prison, that these um, devices, the spit hood is being used incorrectly. Um, and so Tracking Injustice, the organization that's put on this um, symposium and um, is an organization that tracks deaths in custody across Canada, has identified nine specific deaths where spit hoods were involved. And now we can't say that it was the spit hood that caused the death, but in every single instance that I've read, uh, they all had elements of that policy that we're going to consider as a best practice. In every one, there was at least one, if not more, violations. And so I'm going to read you those nine deaths, uh, sorry, the names of those nine people who uh, died at the hands of the state. Christopher Castellane, Abdurahim, Abdurahman Ibrahim Hassan, Jason Sinclair, Corey Rogers, Russell Andrew Spence, Solomon Fakiri, Jonathan Hennock, Derek Whalen, and Nikus Andre Spring. So those are the nine that we know about that a spit hose was used incorrectly. And those are across Canada. Some are Winnipeg, some are Ontario, all across. And so, like I said, Tracking Injustice is the only organization tracking these circumstances. There's no government body see, checking in to see how um, guards or corrections officials are using these instruments. And we can assume that if they're using spit hoods wrong, they're using something else wrong. They're using other um, tools of restraint against policy. Again, when we don't know the policy, it's even easier for them to violate it, right? Um, and so we, again, we sought that ban because of this misuse and because there are safer alternatives, it should be so clear to us that that is not gonna prevent the spread of diseases. Masks, face shields, gloves, those are viable alternatives that are cheap, that actually work and are not gonna cause someone's death. And in fact, Jarrett Miriam, a, he is now the superintendent of the uh, jail that Mr. Fakiri died in. He testified at the inquest and he agreed with what I'm saying, that guards are given access to um, PPE, that spit hoods really shouldn't be used, um, and they're not that effective. So we should be banning these use entirely because they so often lead to people's death. Unfortunately, though, the jury decided not to adopt uh, the full ban as a recommendation. They only requested an overall use of force review, which, as we heard, I think, Yusuf say, none of the recommendations have been implemented yet. And so that means none of the tools of force that guards use have been reviewed. So we don't know how badly they're violating every policy. Of course, this is not the outcome we wanted. And unfortunately, when Lydia and I do this work, when most people do this work, we kind of get used to not having the outcomes we want. Um, but I do want to leave things here on a more positive note because I do think that even though there's so many issues with inquests, that recommendations are not binding uh, and that governments can kind of ignore them, there is a really important element to them, which is the education and the spreading awareness. So some of you knew about spit hoods, but now all of you do, right? You can go out and you can talk about these things. Corrections is secretive and is only able to continue because it's so secretive. They keep that curtain pulled tight and anytime someone wants to pull it back, they get to rely on safety. Oh, well, we can't tell you this because it would put them at risk. It would put prisoners at risk. It always comes back to this idea of safety, but whose safety? Whose safety is important? It seems to me that it's only the guards because they're not considering the safety of prisoners. So, Tons of issues with the inquest process, but the awareness is key. It, the only way that we're going to be able to um, reveal what's happening behind um, the prison doors, the only way we're going to be able to prevent future deaths, if we spread awareness, if you talk to your friends, if you have the uncomfortable conversations with family members, you publish, you're all academics here, publish, write on this, talk about this. People don't care enough about prisoners because we write them off so quickly. Oh, they've done something bad, so they're fine. They're in there for their worst moment, but they are full people. They have good days and bad days just like us. We are all very privileged in this room as well, um, but many of the people who end up in jail just simply don't have the privilege that we have access to. It, 
one small change in your life could end you and lead you to be in a prison just like Mr. Fakiri, just like the names that I read out. So spread awareness, talk about this issue. It's tough and it's scary, but the only way we can actually prevent future deaths in custody is if we spread awareness. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Lydia and Alexandria, for your amazing work and for your support of Tracking Injustice. Um, it was really, really powerful and impactful. Um, so as you've heard, uh, our speaker, Lindsay Jennings, my colleague who's wonderful and powerful, who is a person who has survived incarceration and homelessness um, and is a leader in our project, Tracking Injustice, is not able to join us today. Um, and so I am going to um, talk about a little bit about our project. In no way would I do justice to her. She's way more um, important and wonderful than I am. But I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our uh, project that you've heard referenced a number of times, the Tracking and Justice Project. I'll see if this thing works for changing slides. I don't know where I'm so. Oh, oops. Okay. I just wanted to start with this um, slide, which is uh, crosses. Um, that have been put up by family members who've lost their loved ones at Elgin uh, Middlesex Detention Center in London, Ontario. And to highlight that a lot of our work around responding to deaths in custody is led first by families who've done and initiated their own um, responses and called for accountability and transparency from these organizations that have killed their loved ones. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, the work of Sarah Spate, who uh, we lost and one of uh, lost last year around this time, who is one of the leaders in terms of doing work on uh, calling attention to, tra uh, to deaths in custody as a PhD student at the University of Ottawa. Um, and I co-authored this report with her based on her research, um, which kind of first identified the uh, alarming rise in deaths in custody that was happening in Ontario. Um, which Lydia already spoke about, so I won't kind of um, <clears throat> uh, address this more. But just to give you a sense of the increase in rise in, in deaths in custody in Ontario, um, there was uh, in 2021 there was 41 deaths um, uh, uh, increase from 23 the year before, and um, this gives you an overall kind of trend. You can see our this report on our, our on our website trackinginjustice.ca. Um, but just to give you a sense of the trend in terms of the increase that occurred. Um, this is a result of uh, our, a thing that came out of our project, Tracking Injustice, which is a project through uh, Carleton University, the University of Toronto, and Queen's University that also works a lot with community-based organizations. We work with uh, Aboriginal Legal Services quite closely and the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. And we have been working to try and track and make sense of deaths in custody in a context where there is a lot of obfuscation, a lot of lack of transparency, and a lot of la a lack of accountability. So uh, our website provides uh, somewhat real-time numbers in terms of deaths that are occurring across uh, Canada in relation to giving us kind of a, an enumerated picture of this issue. And so the two numbers at the bottom are deaths are the current context that we know of in terms of deaths in custody across Canada. 79 deaths since January 2023 and since the year 2000. We know of around 1,500 deaths, although we also received a recent uh, access to information requests from the province of Quebec and we received around 300 deaths uh, from them um, that we, had, we hadn't been aware of. So uh, that number plus 300. <clears throat> Uh, what we have done in terms of the, our work, and this is le led by Lindsay Jennings, is uh, we wanted to, uh, we are a project uh, looking at transparency and collecting data, but we understand that this data is a co connected directly to people's deaths, very horrific deaths um, that have an impact on people and their communities and their families. So the first thing we did with our project is launch a, a memorial page to uh, highlight and acknowledge and remember um, everyone that we are aware of that has died in custody across Canada um, to acknowledge uh, their lives and not just turn them into a spreadsheet um, of deaths, which is also what our project is doing in consultation with people's families. Um, so you can access this memorial page and it gives you a sense of um, the scope and scale of how many people have died in each province, including their names. And we have family members contacting us on a regular basis to give us updated information about their loved ones because they're very um, 
honored to have their uh, memory a place where the people can be remembered. <clears throat> so, um, and uh, just in terms of um, how we define custody, just for some people, this was a kind of ongoing negotiation. How do we define custody in relation to our death, uh, in relation to collecting um, information for our project? So uh, we have a definition of here that we define custody as being held in a condition where the right to liberty is deprived by police after being arrested by jail or a penitentiary workers in a corrections facility. Uh, corrections facility uh, due to criminal charges or prosecution or in the care facility under a legal order due to mental health legislation. Um, and we have some examples of what that could mean afterwards. Um, in terms of trying to track this information, um, and there's a number of people who work on this project in, our, in the audience and you'll uh, be uh, who are aware of how challenging it is to track this information. There is little there's little consistent or public reporting about deaths in custody in, uh, across Canada from institutions where, in which people die. Um, we have been aware or we have learned of, we have no family members connected to our project who have found out that their loved one died due to a Facebook post from uh, someone else who knows someone who's incarcerated who posted because the institutions in Ontario themselves don't have a family liaison who follows through on actually contacting family members. Um, and so uh, there's generally very limited accountability or public accountability or even acknowledgement of someone's death. We know of so many unknowns where we don't even know the person's name, their age, or anything. So people are very much erased within these institutions. Uh, our project has been working using access to information requests across the province to, uh, and also web scraping coroners, um, corrections websites to try and get as much information as we can. And interestingly, e even these own institutions, when we do get responses from uh, access to information requests, they don't even have a full under accounting or understanding of the scope of the problem in their own institutions. We've actually found deaths that they didn't have, have accounted for afterwards. And so that's quite shocking, just in terms of the lack of systems for accounting for people's lives and deaths doesn't exist in many places. In a, in a comprehensive way. Um, a key aspect of our project, which is, um, is that our project is uh, led um, and inspired by and driven by people with lived experience um, and informed by families. Um, and we have what we call a family council who uh, we consult with on a regular basis around aspects of our project to make sure that we are discussing issues in a way that does not stigmatize people um, further. Uh, often people are blamed for their own deaths in, these, in the context of these institutions. Inquests are often a way for people to be constructed as responsible for their own death and we do not want to contribute to that context and so work with family, families to uh, figure out ways to talk about this issue and frame numbers around this issue and uh, talk about um, the extent of this issue without further stigmatizing people. Um, and so, um, the, yes, and Yusuf also talked about the lack of oversight and lack of support. Finally, just a, a small um, uh, accounting of what we know to date, and I gave you a little bit of information on this already, but we know of upwards of 1,700 deaths in custody since the year 2000 across Canada. Um, <clears throat> and we know that this number is increasing. So between um, to the year 2000 and 2021, we have determined that there is an average of around 65 0.9, so 66 people who have died in custody across Canada each year uh, across the, those first 21 years. But in the past two years, we've seen 71 deaths and then 78 deaths. So we know of an increase. The average age of all of these 700, over 1,700 people who have died is 44.5 years old. Um, I am 50, uh, 45 years old and uh, uh, that is not a natural age to die. Um, so we know that uh, many of these deaths are due to the conditions of confinement, not because of natural occurrences. Approximately one third of these deaths are suicides. And we know in a context of remand, where in, in Ontario now around 80% of people are in remand, in remand you have a fourfold increase of suicide. So the more people we have in remand and our remand population is growing, the more suicides we're going to see and we're seeing that. Um, we have a high number of preventable overdoses um, that we also see. And we also, uh, and going through uh, death classifications, have seen 
a high number of deaths that are classified as natural. When you actually look into the circumstances of those deaths, there's nothing natural about them. Um, we, I reviewed a death recently in which someone was hold, held in a four-point manual restraint, meaning they were held down by four different guards with someone pushing in their back. They died of a heart attack, of cardiac arrest in that uh, position, um, and that was considered to be that, that, that person dying of a natural death. Um, we have seen people dying due to injuries that are untreated and people dying due to medical neglect, dying of AIDS in a context where they could have been provided treatment um, uh, to save their life, and they weren't. Um, and so the natural death classification is a way to often obfuscate um, uh, medical neglect or just neglect in the institution or actual full-on violence. And just in terms of a little bit of a local context for people who are interested in OCDC, the institution that's closest to us, we know of 21 deaths at OCDC um, since the year 2000. And that 21 deaths includes a newborn who died at the age of one outside of the institution, um, but it was due to birth complications uh, in a segregation unit at OCDC that, that the child died. Um, so uh, our project is continuing to try and collect work, uh, to, to collect information about these deaths and report on them to try and call for accountability. And I know that's not a greatest note to end on, but I'm also sending lots of love to my colleague, Lindsay Jennings, and I'm going to pass it over to um, Megan Linton, who is going to um, talk about her wonderful work and her doctoral work. So Megan Linton um, is a doctoral student in sociology and political economy at Carleton University. Her research uses critical disability and carceral studies to challenge disability, institutionalization, and its profit motives. Recently, she worked alongside institutional survivors to produce and write the Invisible Institutions podcast. Megan works closely with disability justice movements and believes in producing research um, for and in the community. Her writing has been published in Briar Patch Magazine, The Disability Visibility Project, um, Canadian Dimension, CBC Opinions, The Hamilton Spectator, and The Ottawa Citizen. And I believe um, Megan's slides should be uh, can I, hooked up now. Yeah, I'll go. Stop talking about me. Okay, I'm gonna see. Does my head pop up if I'm a no? A little bit. Well, okay, that's okay. I'll try. I'll start with standing. Um, thank you. Uh, start at the beginning with my actual thank you. Thank you so much for including me in. Oh, Okay, awesome. Um, if I do this. You can hear me good? Okay, great. Let's do this. Sorry, tech folks. Okay, sweet. Thank you so much for including me in this incredibly moving and resonant collection of refusals, refusals to accept any more state killings of our kin comrades, family, community members, and strangers. My name is Megan Linton. I'm a PhD student in sociology, but I would say that I'm here today as a disabled and mad survivor of institutionalization, a community member, and an organizer with the Disability Justice Network of Ontario. We're a provincial organization committed to abolitionist organizing against prisons and all forms of institutionalization that confine and kill disabled, mad, and older people. There we go. Um, Currently, we are operating prison phone lines from six regions with calls coming from Hamilton, Kenora, Sudbury, Sudbury Penetang, Millhaven, Beaver Creek, and beyond. And these calls and the work with um, folks currently incarcerated has um, allowed us to produce a toolkit um, called Enabling Justice. Uh, you can access it through enablingjustice.com. Um, and it will soon also feature um, s supports for adults and caregivers. But 
going to shift to my work. So um, my research and community work explores cycles of institutionalization in so-called Canada and the confinement of people labeled with intellectual, developmental, and mental disabilities, which is an ongoing phenomenon stretching back more than a century and a half. And I am going to shift away from prisons as sites of custody for the stretch of my talk um, because the brilliant folks um, beside me have addressed many of the major issues. Um, and disability is used as a tool to justify state custody in various other systems, including through the child welfare system alongside the guardianship system, um, both of which are forms of colonial, incredibly paternalistic care that position disabled people under the custody of the state, um, who are then responsible for determining where someone is allowed to live, what medications they take, and who provides their care. A quick example is in Ottawa recently, a woman was barred from getting married because it would move her out of her group home. So you can see kind of the constraints that this puts people, disabled people in. As a disabled community member, I will say that once you brush against any of the thick bureaucratic walls of disability institutions, you are forever haunted by the deaths of your peers, friends, lovers, strangers, and co-conspirators. Through these experiences, it has led me to my own research work, which has resulted in me shifting, sifting through hours and hours of class action settlements, interviews, archives, all replete with stories of death. Death of friends, of roommates, of fellow inmates, of disabled people who died by suicide, who hung themselves from rafters, who died years after escaping the institution, still haunted by their experiences inside. Um, here is an image on screen. On uh, one side, we have a very large tombstone that at the bottom says, or at the top says Protestant and lists all the people uh, who've been buried in, well, some of the people who've been buried in this mass grave. Um, on Treaty 1 territory outside of Winnipeg in Portage La Prairie. Here at the cemetery, an open field down a gravel road, it's filled with hills, hills that rupture the very flat prairie landscape. Walking across them, you know that they are not hills, they are bodies, bodies of community members, friends, siblings people never knew that they had. And these deaths are not supposed to ever leave you. But for a time, these deaths were a catalyst for great social change, bringing about movements to end the institutionalization of disabled people, resulting in commissions and inquiries. But today, the violent deaths occurring in institutions are deemed so mundane that the state rarely believes that it merits an inquest. So, I, along with so many disabled people, are in constant gratitude to Yusuf and the Fakiri family and the movement they built to facilitate the inquest into Suleiman's horrific murder by the state. Both the inquest itself, but I think even more so the movement it created, have shared with the world both the horrific violence that the state is willing to perpetrate and how much disabled people are loved cared for and part of our communities. Inquests are a practice of leaving evidence, evidence of the harms and violences of the state, which are otherwise obfuscated. It ensures that people committing acts of violence know that their actions are being documented. For the individuals, kin networks, and communities who have suffered, it lets them and us know that their suffering is seen and not unnoticed. Leaving evidence is an important praxis within disability justice movements. As organizer Mia Mingus explains, we must always leave evidence, evidence that we were here, that we existed, that we survived and loved and ached, evidence of the wholeness we never felt and the immense sense of fullness we gave to each other. 
evidence for each other that there are other ways to live past survival, past isolation. This evidence of wholeness, of being loved, cherished, and known are rarely fulfilled by the inquest process. It is only upon experiencing the love shared between families, patient networks, and communities that you are able to experience the wholeness and complexity and lightness of their personhood. As Yusuf so beautifully began by sharing at the beginning, Solomon was a big brother who taught, who loved, and who was cherished. These are the memories and stories that we should be given every opportunity to know and experience. My personal organizing work with families and communities who have lost loved ones in horrific experiences in these institutions um, has not been able to go public yet. These were deaths that were obfuscated, ignored, or accepted, as disabled people's lives are frequently already marked or deemed already dead or worse than dead. I am going to turn now to a death that has already been gone public. Um, and I do this because it's so complicated and difficult to bring stories um, to the public eye. Namely because, um, as Alex mentioned, there's a lack of financial support um, for families to hire lawyers. There's a lack of information for them about what was happening inside. And then there's the additional challenge of finding reliable journalists who trust the stories, who don't believe that, oh, it was justified to perform a four-point restraint or that the rap is a valid method of um, confining a young disabled teenager. So on the screen here, um, I, it has remembering Justin, the system and home that killed him. So on the left hand side of the screen um, is an image of a small house with four sets of stairs leading up to it. And underneath it is the name of the institution that killed him. Um, it's called Interphase, and it's a private for-profit group home. Justin uh, Sanguiano was a gentle brother and son. His death was not immediately considered for an inquest. He had been placed in the custody of the state through the child welfare system and was forced around the age of 10 or 11 into a for-profit unlicensed group home for youth labeled with intellectual and developmental disabilities. The workers, during his time in the group home system, the workers abruptly changed his schedule. Doing this, they knew that it would send him into a spiral. But from there, they decided to restrain this child in their care, forcing him against a wall then into the prone position with their knee on his back. He was rubbing against the ground so frequently that his face became entirely rug burnt. And it was only when another staff member entered the room that they checked on this child. They had had him restrained for minutes, potentially hours. It was at this point that they realized he wasn't breathing. With their hands on his arms, their knee on his back, they failed to feel his breath leave his body. These staff members killed Justin and no inquest, no criminal charges, and no public report came to light. They rationed that the restraint was used according to policy. Just as with Solly, the medical doctor had prescribed a deadly restraint for this soft and sweet child. These moments remind me of something that Sarah Jama said a while back, which is that there is a brotherhood amongst medical doctors who are willing to protect themselves against the patients they kill. Indeed, it was only when another 10 children died that reporters began digging into this story eventually getting it published and then taking part in a super inquest amongst the deaths of 11 youth. This normalization of disabled death and of deaths of children in custody is an important component in understanding 
the lack of information and outrage regarding the violence and murder of disabled, black, brown, indigenous, queer, and poor people in the entire continuum of institutions. And so we're tasked with the project of making this evidence, of working through all of this trauma and pain and violence to count, to make the reports, to write the stories of our loved ones, of our family members, of our peers. I met Alex during this process and the tracking and, um, and the entire tracking and justice project following my work in 2020 and 2021, um, counting the individual deaths of disabled people in disability institutions through COVID-19. Through this process, um, which I began after realizing, of course, no one was doing it, I began to understand the systems prohibiting access to the information on institutions including a lack of information on the total number of people institutionalized in Canada. And so I began counting. But the process of counting these current le deaths led me to more and more, to hundreds and then to thousands of deaths across Canada that have happened to disability institutions over the last 10 years, 20 years, 100 years. These deaths have never been counted. And so again, I began counting. And as the numbers grew and I felt I needed to do something with them, it was only amongst abolitionists that I found the people and places that cared and that would hold this information. Oh, yeah. Um, and so on the screen, we have my most recent FOI request. Um, and it's for $360, um, and this is to find the number of people who've been restrained by the state in the last uh, eight years. And so through this process, I have also filed multiple FOI requests. And it really only struck me uh, when I was sitting there just how many deaths were happening in these institutions. Um, Alex was talking about the roughly 70 to 90. And for, youths, for youth in custody of the state, there's around 90 to 100 deaths in uh, care a year in Ontario. And the numbers that I've been receiving from the smallest portion of the developmental services sector, so this houses less than 20,000 people, and all the other places house much more, including prisons, long-term care facilities, um, and all of the other horrific places people are forced to live because they have various forms of disabilities and impairments. The numbers for these institutions are more than, have been more than 200 to 300 and even some years 400 deaths in a 20,000 person institution. This is so many people and these deaths are just assumed as part of this process, as part of what is supposed to happen to disabled people, that we just die. And that's, part, you know, there's an entire system of coding it where it's the disability adjusted life years where we're just expected to die earlier and through natural causes. But what the natural causes are is never listed. And the information about who these people are is never listed. And so I just want to emphasize this enough. There's two, more than 200 deaths every year in a system that houses 20,000 people. That is so many, and that is so horrific. And that's only in one province. That's only in Ontario. So this is a part of a long history. So I'm going to shift back to history and then I'll finish. I'm sorry, am I running out of time? Okay, <laughs> so... Um, on the screen, we have um, a large set of um, what looks like tiles. These are cemetery stones. Um, I want to share that many of these stones over time have been taken and used as paving stones, as uh, places to, as stones to replace bricks in walls and as uh, the tiles for a courtyard. 
These are cemetery tiles with patients, the patient number of who they were when they died. And people walk all over them. Um, this cemetery is at the Heronia Regional Center, one of the first large scale institutions for people labeled with intellectual disabilities in Ontario, which operated from 1887 to 2009. My work making evidence um, comes from a legacy of disabled people doing this work, creating evidence. Um, and so this is, comes from the Remember Every Name project a group of survivors um, who've been leading this work to remember every single person who died in that institution. Historians, survivors, and advocates have spent decades trying to determine the exact number of people buried in this mass grave, which has been estimated between 1,379 people and 2,000 people. And this these stones, this cemetery, deprives us, all of us, every single one of us, of the wholeness and complexity of disabled life within these institutions, of the peers, of the friends, of the love that has been shared. And for generations, it re reduced people down to only a patient number. I think we all deserve to know who did what and what happened to the 2,000 people buried at Heronia and every institution, whether an Indian hospital, a residential school, or an institution for people with intellectual disabilities strategically placed across this entire country. Academics, community historians, families, and advocates have been responsible for unearthing these harms. But we need more records of the violences that have occurred. We need the evidence, the names, the addresses of those who have caused so many of these horrific harms. For the past decade, deaths and institutions have haunted our various communities. But now we are finally coming together to build, to resist this various forms of grief, of loss, of murder, of death. <laughs> And I think as Yusuf began this talk, there are more deaths that happen behind bars, behind locked windows, in small homes or massive prisons, in institutions that will never be permitted to visit. And so it is our job to keep, to leave, and to maintain this evidence in order for all of us to be safe, to be cared for, to be remembered, and to be loved. Um, and yeah, I just want to say that there should be no more deaths in any form of custody and we have a deep and constant need to know the stories of our disabled community members and also all of our various community members who've been taken from us. Thank you, Megan, for your powerful words and your amazing, amazing research. Um, I'm really grateful for you and all of your work. Um, and I'm glad we met and got to connect and work together. Um, so uh, maybe we can bring Yusuf back uh, to our, the room. Um, and uh, now we have a number of minutes for questions from the audience. I know there was a lot of information um, a lot of very heavy information, a lot of very powerful information. Um, Yusuf looks like he wants to say something. Yusuf, I'll hand it over to you. No, I, I just no, want to thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm just, I'm just. Do you, do, do you have a question for anyone or a comment that you wanted to say? Yeah, feel free to grab food or coffee. We have lots, but uh, we'll open it up for questions. And we do have a mic that is circulating, I believe. So um, any questions from the crowd or any questions from our panel to each other? I'll oh, start. We have, I'll a, start. Uh, we have a question over there. Um, I don't know who is doing the mic. I can bring you. Oh, great. Uh, right there. 
Thank you so much. Thanks. Hello. Um, my question is, um, you mentioned that there was video evidence that directly um, proved that what the officers said in their report was false. And I saw the video. And first of all, I just want I am so sorry for your family and for your loss and um, the events that transpired during the final moments of your brother's life. It's not fair. It shouldn't have happened. And first of all, I just want to say I'm sorry. Um, but second of all, there is evidence that they lied, like concrete evidence. So how is it that it's still possible for those individuals those, to still have a job and still have the lives of various other individuals who might have um, other underlying mental health issues or overall health issues? Why do those individuals get to be in a position of such authority? Yeah, that's my question. I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, start, I'll start, start and then start I think Lydia, Lydia might be in a better position to also come. Also come. Um, by the way, I'm hearing an echo. So, so but, um, uh, but I guess but we'll, uh, I'll we'll see if the ta tech people can deal with it, if Clayton can help us out with the echo. Maybe it's because we have two mics going, maybe. But, um, I'll continue. I'll continue. Uh, uh, go for basically, it. Basically, um, uh, 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 in the inquest, you, you would have heard, you heard that, uh, that uh, in one in the CSO report, the guard, the guard um, um, who did uh, who, did, uh, who slapped uh, someone across, uh, across uh, in the hallway, the hallway he didn't include in his report. report. And the question, and the question is, is, why did they? Why would they help from the account? Because there's also because this there's idea also of a culture. Idea of culture, culture, right? Because right? the, the correction isn't, correction isn't left under, left under a, a, scrutiny. A, a scrutiny. And I apologize, and I apologize that I'm not able to articulate for a while because I keep hearing my voice. Hearing. But um, but uh, can everybody still hear me? Okay, perfect. I don't hear my voice. Perfect. Um, uh, you know the uh, it's it's it is quite perplexing uh, when you say okay the, the uh, it came out that the guards did lie that guard did lie but not including that they slap Salman uh, across the hallway in the report. But nothing happens because there's a culture too within corrections. This culture, the, the correction, this was one of the first cases. The, thing, the one thing that made Salman's case a bit unique, and I think some of the panelists might talk about this more, is that corrections were at a level of scrutiny that it rarely would have been held in other cases. The, the actions, the, the tragedies are no different. There's other tragedies similar to Suleiman, but this case that made it a bit unique was that you had, a, you had folks across the nation you know, because uh, the, the movement fought for seven years. So, like, it was under scrutiny. And so um, uh, you, the question is, why weren't they ever held accountable? Well, there's the culture part. And the other part is that um, um, the system is not accustomed accustomed to be held accountable because there's no uh, uh, external oversight, right? And, yeah, it's frustrating and it's difficult. But for me, um, you know, when I heard that information, um, what made me realize is that, um, is that like, I have to keep going. I have to keep going. And even if I don't get justice for Suleiman, this could be the start of something else. So, um, and then, you know, I think Lydia could weigh in a bit more, but the other the thing with inquests is valuable as inquests are, and I believe they're very valuable because it's non-binding. It's non-binding. Uh, uh, I think the legal channels are a bit limited, but, um, um, you know, uh, but I'll let maybe Lydia say things here to comment. Or Alex. Oh, Lydia is going to go for it. Sorry to put you on the spot, Lydia. No, no, not at all. Um, could everyone hear me by this mic? Yeah? OK, great. Um, I'll talk a bit about it. Alex has thoughts, too. Um, so I can answer the question, I guess, in a way that uh, is inadequate. But um, one side of it is labor laws and this concept of progressive discipline. So you can't, you're not supposed to fire someone unless what they did is terrible. What they did is obviously terrible. There's no doubt about that, right? So this would be an event where it should be. But there's also just the way, the narratives that are created that justify these types of actions. And this is something that Alex and I spoke a lot about um, when we were litigating this, was they, the, a slap in the face is a slap in the face, right? But what they call it, is a 
open-handed de-escalation. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? So they have they have special terms for it and they take these and they take what is obviously abuse and they give it a different name, right? And so we see this happen in corrections and other spaces in terms of solitary confinement. They said, oh, we ended solitary confinement. It's called the Structured Intervention Unit now, right? And so tactics and strategies that we know are abusive and that are harming people are relabeled and then justified often. And then that removes the accountability for the people who are using these tactics because, oh, it's in my policy guide. I can use my open-handed de-escalation. But to anybody else, we know what that is, right? It's just a separate system inside. But Alex, you wanted to? Yeah, I want to, you can, everyone can hear me? Uh, back out a little bit. Prisons were designed to control racialized people, queer people, disabled people. They were a means of control. And so when the state, through guards, murders people, that's actually performing the function correctly of the prison. So when they kill people, many of the people that killed Solomon actually got promotions because this is continued to this day. It is a means of controlling people and um, removing from society the people that aren't deemed as valuable. So they aren't held accountable because in the eyes of the state and in the eyes of um, the prison correction system and the institutions around them, they actually have performed the function of the prison correctly, which is a heinous, heinous thought, but we, we need to understand that. I'll, I'll, you can hear me too. I'll also say uh, before um, uh, Solomon's uh, inquest, uh, Tracking and Justice participated in an inquest uh, for San, Shannon Sargent, who died in 2016 at OCDC. Um, she was a woman, indigenous woman, who had a history of drug injection drugs and had uh, uh, heart surgery, um, and was complaining of pain in her heart when she was admitted. Um, after being arrested on a random warrant. Um, um, and instead of bringing her to the hospital, the guard on duty complained that he wanted to go to his cottage for the weekend, and he didn't want to have to bring her to the hospital because it would be take him too long and make him stay later than he wanted to stay. He publicly stated that. He actually stated that during the inquest um, on, on the witness stand. Uh, the outcome of the inquest was homicide because she later died because of not receiving the care that she needed. He still works at OCDC. He still works there. Like, so it's the same context. Um, and so, and we know his name, like, <laughs> but, um, but that man still works at OCDC and it's because of the labor laws. What he did wasn't too egregious enough for him to get fired and he's still there. And there's been no criminal charges laid. Are there other questions from the crowd? Go for it. If I could speak loudly, it helps us get around. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Thank you guys all so much. This was amazing. Um, so my question for you guys is, and kind of to the panel in general, is so it seems like there is, and I'm, I've been wrestling with this a bit in my dissertation, which is why I'm hoping that you guys maybe have an answer. Um, the, when we talk about prisoner rights and we're trying to like basically make structures and systems in order to make prison more palatable for those who are like currently shoved in there how do we do that without then entrenching the prison like how do we do that and still be abolitionist okay. um i think about this constantly and i don't have the answer um, but what, what Alexandria and I talk about a lot is, um, is how to be abolitionist um, while still doing harm reduction. And that's how we frame it. Because in an ideal world, our not-for-profit wouldn't need to exist. Mm -hmm. In an ideal world, we, like, we don't want to have this job. Um, you know, and so we, we, that's how I can you know justify and think about it, but we do. We're, we're constantly asking ourselves. Um, we we have a class um, where that we have with um, several students in the faculty of law at U Ottawa, one of whom is here, and um, and we are constantly grappling with this in the work that we do. How can we um, how can we do the harm reduction work that we want to do? How can we support people and bring awareness to these issues without? entrenching them, right? And so one of the examples that comes to mind for me 
is a campaign, and I think this is actually where Yusuf and I first met many years ago um, on the Bell Let's Talk uh, campaign, and it was not supporting Bell, it was a campaign um, shedding light on, uh, <laughs> on the prisoner phone system, right? And uh, on yeah. how expensive it is and how, um, how unjust it is. And so um, a new phone system was brought in, and of course it's also not just or fair, but it is slightly better. Right? And so for me, it's those kinds of campaigns, I can be an abolitionist and participate in it to get a better phone system, and I view that work as, as harm reduction. I would say also, I mean, we advocate for, uh, as prison abolitionists, advocate for things that mi exactly minimize the harms of the institution. So we see a lot of deaths occurring because healthcare is administered by corrections who are in charge of punishing people. So then healthcare is administered by, in a way that can be withheld as a part of your punishment. So we advocate for healthcare to be administered through the Ministry of Health, which has happened in a couple other provinces, which would severely minimize the amount of harm and death that occurs. But that's not the case in Ontario. Well, healthcare is administered by the same people who are in charge of punishing you. Um, we also, um, yeah, that's one of the main things. And also advocating for oversight, advocating for um, public notifications around when there's deaths, because there's no, there's no requirement on Ontario for that to happen. So some things that could minimize harm and increase accountability are kind of the way forward for us. I think um, in sites of disability confinement. It's working. Good. It's just yeah. really loud. <laughs> um, there's been there hasn't been a single change in the last 20 years that has improved the conditions inside for people inside. Um, and I think that is because abolitionists are not in the space and most of the work is being done outside of the institution but by organizations who are very close to, to what is happening. Um, and many, if not most of those changes um, that have been in place have been to improve some of the conditions for like managers maybe, um, or to improve the lock system to keep people more tightly confined or to um, make the segregation units inside the tiny group home that we saw on the screen earlier be padded. Um, and all of those push people further into incarceration, in, into confinement. Um, and I'll say that like I don't, I think in prisons it's very different, but I don't think the health system is, and their involvement in developmental services um, will ever result in any changes. Um, and instead it usually puts people further into control and you know being medicated and all those things. So I think um, within developmental services it, it is helpful because there isn't reforms that have been made and so you can just say this entire system has been the same and has been increasingly punitive um, and ha needs to be entirely flattened when it's not doing anything when there's no changes being made and when the only changes over the last 20 years have been making it more and more difficult to access information or for more and more young people to be put into long-term care facilities where, again, there's no information. Um, yeah. We had a question over there, I believe. So earlier you guys mentioned how in like the prison systems there was someone who didn't feel like taking somebody to get proper care because he wanted to go like to his cabin for the weekend. And then there's instances of someone being like assaulted or slapped but open-handed striked and they get like either rewarded or minimally punished or completely like ignored. So is there any instances of someone like what would be egregious enough that someone actually like gets fired and like reprimanded for it? Because we've seen like it leads to death, someone's assaulted and nothing. That's a great question. <laughs> I'm not quite sure because- Yusuf, Yusuf has a response yeah. I believe. I mean, even if, I thank you for that thank question. For that question. Uh, uh, my wonderful my echo wonderful is back, is back. So maybe Clayton can take care, can take care of that. Um, um, but I'll continue. Uh, we, we've clearly seen that, we've clearly seen that uh, even if someone's action that leads to someone's death, they're not held accountable uh, or uh, 
uh, whether it's a slap or the cabin, you know, going to their cabin, there's, a, you know, there's the human resources issues, uh, whatever you want to call it. There's no accountability, whether it's a human resource accountability or criminal accountability. Uh, you know, I think it goes back. I mean, my solution, maybe uh, uh, Alex, uh, Lydia or Megan talk, could talk a bit more. I mean, at least the path, the one path that I think that we need to keep hitting, like uh, uh, working on is that this oversight. This oversight that goes and does their own investigation within corrections, right? I, I'm not saying that that's going to solve everything, but at least it's a path forward that at least could do a cultural shift, right? Because we're dealing with two things here. There's this culture within corrections that you can do as ever as you please because you're housing these very horrible human beings. Sarcasm. These are human beings, right? There's this, this cultural thing, and these are human beings. They're not horrible. So there's this part, this culture that um, that needs to shift. And then the second part is that what you do here, if you cause someone harm to someone, you're no different for any of us, any one of us that are outside of the outside of these cages. That you need to be held accountable as someone like myself or Alex or Lydia or Megan, you know, if we commit something outside. But and these two things, in my opinion, could be married and um, if we have to start with the oversight, right? I mean, Solomon's murder didn't let any of these most of these guards not to get charged. You know, um, or the, I don't know what happened to these people that did this tragedy to, to this young man named Justin that Megan spoke about, but we start with the oversight. Um, I think that's at least our path forward. Um, that's my two cents. Accountability only, accountability only occurs when the public pressure is so much that the ministry decides, okay, fine, this is too much to deal with. That's essentially what happened with Mr. Fakiri. Only two people lost their jobs after years of advocacy, after years of media scrutiny. That is really the only time that I see accountability occur is when the ministry just frankly gets fed up with how much attention is being brought against them. Or a really great way to get fired is to do something that provides people a little inch of freedom, like a centimeter. And then just like that, it's amazing how those processes are able to work when someone does something like take someone for a walk or give them s some culturally appropriate food or God forbid, speak the same language to them. All of those things have been punitively responded to. I think we have time for one more question. I believe there's one or we'll do the t two remaining questions that I see and then we'll wrap up. Hello. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, I have a twofold question. So for the first, does tracking injustice have an agenda specifically on solitary confinement in federal institutions looking at structured intervention units? And then following with the accountability measure, with Bill S-230, they do have the wanting implementation of having an independent adjudication up to 48 hours. Do you guys have thoughts on this sort of external oversight for solitary confinement? Um, uh, so first of all, we do track uh, type of custody uh, that people are in. So if we do know they are in this kind of specialized custody, whatever the new euphemism is for solitary confinement, structured intervention unit, administrative segregation, which was previously, uh, we do track that information if it's available to us. So we will, I believe, fingers crossed, before Prisoners Justice Day of this year be releasing all of our data to the public where people will be able to access it and look and analyze for themselves um, around uh, the number of deaths that occur in those, in those units. Um, I, uh, and your second question was thoughts on uh, oversight in relation to the use of the units? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I don't think it goes far enough. I don't know if other people have thoughts on that. I don't, I don't believe it does that. Uh, so solitary confinement is considered um, unlawful for any um, person with mental health issues, but we see it happen time and time again. Um, it, frankly, I don't think we should ever be using solitary confinement. Agreed. Um, it's just a means to push off the problem. Um, 
So no, I don't think it ever goes far enough. I don't think it'll go far enough unless we get rid of solitary confinement and every new way that we termed solitary confinement. And I'm always hesitant about oversight bodies because who is on that body? What is their experience? Are they ivory tower academics? No shade to all of you, but have you, do you have lived experience of what it's like to be in solitary confinement and have your sanity slip away because you're in 24 hour light, um, barely getting fed, maybe you're not in proper clothes. So uh, I think oversight makes, the word oversight makes people feel good but you need to interrogate what that means, who's doing it. Yeah, I'm always very hesitant. <laughs> we have a final question over here. Thanks, Jillian. Hi, um, my question is primarily for Megan, but I'm open to any answers. Um, I'm also a disabled individual, and something that you stated uh, rang really true to me, being that as disabled individuals, we're sort of, we're expected to be like already dead or dying or worse than that. Um, and unfortunately, so many of us have to rely on this healthcare system that can also threaten us with institutionalization at any time. So I guess I was just wondering um, how you reconcile like self-advocacy and advocacy against these issues when we also rely so heavily on the very institutions that create the problems in the first place. Thank you for the question. It's such an important one. Um, and I think that probably the biggest uh, piece of that returns to many of the things we're talking about today, which means um, removing police from hospitals. The fact that whenever you go into any Ottawa hospital, whether it be the Ottawa hospital or the Carleton Queens Bay, there's always going to be more police officers than nurses. Um, and also within that system, I think there has to be this very rapid change in both how we treat psychiatric inpatients and um, the process of uh, being sectioned or being formed and who is allowed to be able to make those decisions um, has to also be part of this broader movement for abolition. But I think really the only, I don't think self-advocacy is ever really a fully safe option. And I think that that's why we have to rely on peer structures and on um, the various networks of care that we create to be able to um, work within these systems to keep ourselves alive. Um, but you know that has its shortfalls too. Not everyone has a community of care that can be there at 2 a.m. when the emergency room visit happens. Um, but that's you know why we have to build like a very round network that allows us to have an emergency contact or all of these things. Um, and I will say that the that I think it was Chantal Moore's family um, and the families of people who have been killed in incarceration have done the most work to create systems outside of the healthcare system to keep us safe. Um, and so I, Chantal Moore's family created. Um, these like little sheets where you can fill out the information about um, who your next of kin is, what you want your emergency care decisions to be, who you want to be there um, if you're in the hospital. And all of these things are so important to keeping ourselves safe and to resisting this broader project of um, keeping each other alive and um, refusing to rely on the state for whatever care it deems um, it can provide. So I'm conscious of the time. And uh, Yusuf, you have, one, I think you want to say a final, final word, a final concluding word. So I'll hand yeah. it over to you. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, first of all, um, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. And um, I'm grateful to share this stage with uh, Alex McLean, Lydia Dobson, Alexandra Boni, and Megan. And, to, and thank you for all of you for all the important work. Um, I know we gave you a lot of heavy stuff, uh, ladies and gentlemen, today, but I, I just, um, I want to leave this conversation today. I want us to leave this conversation today with hope. Uh, the work that has been done by these panelists and folks that are doing this work. Um, uh, yes, we're not there where we need to be, but I want all of you to know that the hope lies with you, that this system can and will change if we continue to keep knocking 
at the door. Keep knocking and knocking. I know some of us have to pay with our blood and sweat, but I want all of you to know that what what the, this work, um, that you leave it with hope, that the systems can change because, um, and if we continue, uh, the leaders will be forced one day to, have to transform these systems. I know it's sometimes slow, but I want everybody to know to leave with, with a positive note because I don't want us to think uh, being gloomy, and none, none of this could change. But I, I think this is why we need your help, whether it's Lydia's work, Alexandria's, or Megan, or, or the Tracking and Justice work, support these organizations um, because uh, they're doing the work for the rest of us, right? And, and we leave the hope. So I leave you with those words. I, I, I don't mean to talk too much, but I hope that was of value, uh, at least from my perspective. Thank you so much, Yusuf, and much respect to you. And again, thank you for sharing your words and your emotion and your passion and your energy with all of us. We're very inspired by you and continue to be. And so much respect for you and, care and spending time with us today. And thank you to uh, prison legal supports, uh, prisoner legal supports uh, from Al for Alexandria and Lydia. And thank you to Megan Linton um, and to all of you. I hope all of you will join us in calling for no more deaths in custody. And I uh, also just wanted to highlight again this upcoming fundraiser. Come and scan this QR code if you want to support more advocacy uh, around legal supports for prisoners in Ontario. And we have an endless supply of pizza. Please indulge. So take care. Thank you so much. All the best, everybody. Thank you.